Well, I think the people like you worked with him were, were regarded themselves as being fortunate to work with him. Uh, I mean, he he was he didn't, as I said, have too many flops in his life. <laughs> he did choose well, and and he was a wonderful actor to work with. I mean, you see the work he did with with Ronnie Corbett. I mean, the two of them, it's a wonderful combination. He, he was a generous performer too, of course. That's the other thing. You know, he he didn't try to be a star. He was a star, but didn't try to be one. He didn't kind of, you know, step center stage and say, you no, know, I demand you look at me. You looked at him because he was very good at what he did. What was he like to interview? He was impossible. He wasn't. He didn't like it. I mean, I, <laughs> I tried twice, and I we were friends. <laughs> I had a hard time, but, but because not because he was being he was being indifferent, but, but because he genuinely did not like talking about himself. He couldn't think why there was all that fuss. He just couldn't understand that he was doing a job, and his job he did to the best of his ability, and he, he couldn't understand why people sort of made a fuss of him. I mean, he, he, of course. I mean, he he, he loved going back to, to BAFTA and getting that that big BAFTA award. Of course, he did, because that was that was due recognition of of, of his talent and the years he put in the business. But generally speaking, he was an object lesson to to a lot of people who actually seek the limelight with, with half his talent. He stood the test of time, didn't he? Was that because he he represented perhaps a gentler age? No, I think because he was hugely talented, and and I think because he had a regard for the word, for the written word. And, and as I said, he had a good judgment about it, a writer's judgment he had about, about what worked and what didn't work. And, uh, and of course, too, I mean, years and years of experience came to bear. I mean, he wasn't, just in, he wasn't just invented by television. I mean, what you saw on television was the result of lots and lots of hard work in writing comedy, performing comedy. He was a finished article when he appeared on television. Now, we were earlier this year shown glimpses of, of the old two Ronnies when, when he and Ronnie Corbett, Corbett were reunited, mm. and people watched it in droves. They still had it, didn't they? Yes, I mean, there's a, there's a lesson there maybe for, for program makers. You know, they've, they've gone very far down the road of looking for this sort of 16 to 34 audience while missing out on a larger audience, which includes myself, who would sit there and, and relish the, the thought of two people as talented as those two coming back and doing another kind of series. They'd have to be very, very good at their jobs to, to equal or, or, or surpass what the two Ronnies did. What was your favourite Ronnie Barker character? I love him in Porridge. I just thought it was a magnificent, rounded performance. I mean, what you had there was a wonderful comic creation, and yet a fully fleshed-out character. So you laughed at him, but there's also something about him as well that was much deeper, much more profound. And that was Ronnie's talent. That was his, 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 his genius, if you like. Michael Parkinson, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Well, let's speak now to, the, uh, to John Plowman, the BBC Head of Comedy Entertainment. And as we've been hearing from Michael Parkinson there, and as I'm sure many people to come, a, a wonderful comic creation. Extraordinary. I mean, a, a, you know, a genius, a, a, an extraordinary talent that we've lost. And kind of an encourager of young talent as well as, uh, uh, as, well as a keen uh, um, exponent of his own. Um, somebody was telling me a story only yesterday about... Uh, uh, Peter Kay, who was a huge fan of Ronnie's and, and nervous of writing to him, and uh, uh, finally plucked up the courage and wrote a, wrote a you know, eulogizing letter to him. And um, Barker sent him a letter back uh, on uh, HM Prison Slade uh, note paper that he'd had specially, uh, specially done. Uh, and, and he wrote it in the character of Fletch. <laughs> which was, uh, you know, just a, just a wonderful thing for him to do to a younger to a younger comedian. Uh, and and Peter, I know, took took the compliment well, and and indeed went out and got some paper printed in the uh, Phoenix Knights Club uh, name and uh, and wrote back in his own character. Just uh, no, an extraordinary guy, and and as I say, an encourager as well as a as well as a brilliant performer and writer. But what was it about him that made him so special then? I think he had an everyman quality, uh, but I think he, as Michael was saying, he kind of loved words. Um, you know, the story is, is famous of, of the fact that he wrote some of the two Ronnies under a pseudonym of Gerald Wiley uh, in order to see whether what he wrote would get through, as it were. You know, he didn't want to be treated specially uh, with it. Uh, and I think uh, there was a there was then a meeting at which all the writers were gathered, and Gerald Wiley didn't appear, and and Barker finally owned up. Um, 
which was kind of a mark of the man. You know, he wanted to check that uh, anything he did was was of the highest quality. As we've been hearing from David Sidato here, hugely meticulous. Um, he said his favourite character was um, was Fletch in Porridge. What do you think? Uh, You'd have to go the a long way or... to beat that, wouldn't you? Sorry. I think I'd join him on that. I think I'd join him on that. I mean, you know, uh, it, it, you say the two words, Ronnie and Barker, and you kind of go, well, that's Fletch. But it's also all those wonderful sketches, I suppose, Four Candles is, is the one I remember just because it's just an extraordinary piece of writing. And also the the the, the marvellous kind of pieces to camera, the, the sort of appeals he did, the... Uh, uh, you know, appeals on behalf of obscure uh, apparent charities and things where uh, he would answer the question before the question had been answered. Um, there's an extraordinary number of sketches he does that in. Just, just a genius. And the timing of this, of course, we were just saying that you know, his, his comedy has stood the test of time. Indeed, he just launched a retrospective, a look back at his career. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it... Uh, I think what was interesting about the, the reuniting earlier this year was it got a young audience as well as it got an old audience. You know, he he, he could just do it. So, and it wasn't... So we were just saying he, it was the acting, it was the writing that he was so yeah. um, so good at. What was he like um, to, to work with? We know What were the reports that people said well, he was I like to say, work I with? Mean, I, I didn't work with him very much. I was lucky enough to work with him a couple of times, but, but only on very small things. He was, he was a professionalist. I mean, you, you know, he was a man who wanted to make sure everything worked before he did it. And uh, I think we can all respect that. Thank you very much for joining us. OK. We'll talk now to Michael Hurl, who was producer of The Two Ronnies. Michael, good morning to you. Good morning. There's one line I'm reading here uh, from Ronnie Barker. The man who invented the zip fastener was today honoured with a lifetime peerage. He will be known as Lord of the Flies. They don't write them like that anymore, do they? No, they don't. And that was the great thing about Ronnie Barker. He wrote for a family audience. So much of the comedy we have nowadays is after the watershed. But... So. You're obviously, uh, you're hearing Ronnie Barker, I think, uh, you're probably watching this very programme. And uh, when you look at pictures of Ronnie Barker, what goes through your mind? What goes through my mind is the way that he passed on his fountain of knowledge on comedy. He used to sit with those of us who produced his shows and say, that's a good joke, but I tell you what, if we just change that word, put that word there, put this here, and it was a bit like learning Latin verse. You know, there was a rhythm to a joke, and he was able to show us how that worked, and it worked every time in the news desk sequence. What was your favourite Ronnie Barker line? Oh, it'll be a slightly rude one. I, I think we can forgive that, given that we're looking back at a wonderful career. I, I think uh, the one where he said that a Billy Smart's elephant did a ton on the M1 and motors, motorists uh, have to treat it as a roundabout. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, there was the other one. The toilets at a local police station have been stolen. Oh, yeah. Police say they've got nothing to go nothing on. Nothing to go on. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it was good, honest, you know, comedy in the old musical tradition. And... What about when he worked with Ronnie Corbett? He, he was able to change gear, wasn't he, every time? Yes, he was. Um, I mean, that was an absolutely marvellous partnership, which, will, like Morgan and Wise, I don't think we'll see the like of again. Because it really... You felt... I know with Ronnie Barker, you felt safe with him. You, you knew the whole family could watch, Granny and the kids and that, and you felt safe. You didn't have to worry whether anything crude or rude would be said. He, you, he was a great... And you knew you, knew you were going to laugh. Mm. With Ronnie Barker, immediately he came on the screen, you knew it was going to amuse you. It, it looked so effortless, which probably means it really wasn't. Believe me, it didn't. I mean, the great thing about Ronnie Barker, he was very demanding, uh, he was very precise in what he wanted, he was always right. Always right, and... Uh, you know, it proves that you can't just go on and tell jokes. You have to work out the construction. Do you have a particular memory of him? Do I have a memory of him? Again, it, he always had trouble keeping his weight down. We were in Australia, and he said to me one evening, he said, Michael, I'm really doing well. He said, I've had a leaf of lettuce today, a piece of ham with the, the fat cut off, I've, I've had a tomato, 
and uh, I've had an apple. And I said, that's wonderful, Ronnie. And that's all you've had? He said, yes. He said, now let's open another bottle of red wine. <laughs> uh, Michael, uh, I I'm sure many, many tributes will be paid throughout the day. You, you work particularly closely with him. Uh, a, f a final word from you about what Ronnie Barker meant to comedy in this country. Ronnie, Co Ronnie Barker is meant to comedy in this country. Laughs, big laughs and laughs that you will always remember. Michael, a, f a fine tribute. Thank you very much indeed. Michael Hull there, who was producer of The Two Ronnies. Let's come back to David. That was a lovely note to end on. Laughs, big laughs, and laughs that uh, you'll always remember. And as we were hearing from John Plowman uh, uh, as well, um, head of, the, head of uh, comedy entertainment for the BBC, um, he was an inspiration to new talent as well. Very much so. You're looking at a, a number of comedians at the moment who've uh, realised, if you actually look at the way that people talk about comedy, who are sort of like comedy experts, they say it's dark or it's edgy or it's surreal or it's cutting edge. The only thing that matters about comedy is whether actually people laugh or not. And people laughed and they tuned in and they watched Ronnie Barker in their millions and that was the thing about it. It was successful. And never uh, an uneasy laugh. I no, was it was, it was, it, it, it could have been silly, it could have been a pun, it could have been something you thought to yourself, it was a bit of a groan as well, but it was, it was nothing that could truly offend you, nothing that, that was challenging you too much. Yeah. Um, I mean, you only have to read the odd line, and I'm sorry to do this, but they are so funny. And here's another one. In a packed programme tonight, we'll be talking to an out-of-work contortionist who says he can no longer make ends meet. I mean, you, 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 you can't do it, can you? It, it, he got away with everything. And I think it's demeanour as well, isn't yeah. it? And also, he was blessed. He was blessed with Ronnie Corbett. I think the two mm. worked extraordinarily well mm. together. And I don't think the show would have lasted so long had the two not actually worked so well together. There was no rivalry between them. They both enjoyed one another's company. And they, seemed, they arrived on set and then could have their own separate lives afterwards. And you, you realise that once something like that works on screen and people have this affection for them both, that both of them then can go on to their own strengths. And you remember that in the show, the two Ronnies, each one would have their own special areas, and they would come together always for the musical sequence at the end. And you suddenly realised he was a song and dance man. I mean, a song and dance man in his own style as well. But, you know, if I talk to my friends and I'm, to my family, they all, they all remember those times when they were dressed up as uh, washing ladies at the end, you know, they're beating on the, uh, the pots and pans, and they say, and this stuff stays with you. And you think to yourself, gosh, I've watched so much television, but it's these things that stick in your mind and those are the, the, the magic sort of common memories and that's why you know he's so, so loved I think and, and that was also it was also interesting to hear Michael Parkinson as an example say and yet he was so shy he was uneasy with this level of fame that he achieved and this recognition that he achieved what do we know about him very very little mm. indeed he didn't do interviews he didn't uh, appear in hello center spreads we didn't know about life at all I mean he was very very private indeed and all we saw was the stuff that he'd worked very, very hard to present. So there was no point where we were seeing him, you know, you know maybe uh, not thinking about what he was doing or anything like that. So the material was always well thought, and that means we view him always with the quality with which he produced. And he wrote under this, interesting listening to this, this pseudonym, Gerald Willey, Wiley, that, that he wrote under. Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, Back in the days of the Frost Report, it was uh, David Frost uh, who um, had him on as a, a comedy writer as much as anything. Um, but his view was that he wanted his sketches and his not to be included in programmes because he was a name, because he was a great performer. And they say, oh, well, well, we'll have Ronnie's stuff on as well. So if he had a separate name, Jared Wiley, um, then you know, it would, there, it would get on purely on the merits of how good it was. And uh, after a while, of course, everyone knows that uh, it was his material and an awful lot of what he uh, did on the, uh, the two Ronnies that we remember him so well for, the wordplay stuff, when he's the bumptious civil servant mm. telling us complete gobbledygook that goes on and on and on forever. And, uh, you know, that was very much what Ronnie Barker was producing. What was your favourite character of his? Um, I'm a fan of Arkwright on open all hours. I think if you're a northerner, it's, uh, you've, you've been to those shops and uh, my family ran a shop rather like it. Um, so uh, we had a lot of sort of, uh, uh, sort of feeling of affection for this sort of uh, that, uh, lifestyle. And it was, all, it was very true. Uh, everyone had met an Arkwright. Yeah. And, uh, and of course, the wonderful relationship with David Jason, both in Porridge yeah. and of course in, in open all hours. And again, it is these... He was a great actor, and you, you've got to say, yes, he was a great comic writer, he was a great comedian, but it was the fact that he was 
created perfect characters. Fletch is so different from Arkwright, is so different from all the characters he was producing in uh, The Two Ronnies, and uh, it has to be a mark of someone special. David Sidote, thank you very much. It's uh, coming up to quarter to ten. This is BBC News 24. That breaking news, the comic actor and comedian Ronnie Barker has died at the age of 76. Best known as one half of the comedy duo, The Two Ronnies, he also had huge success with Porridge and Open All Hours. In 2004, he was honoured by BAFTA with a special tribute award and returned to our screens earlier this year to present The Two Ronnies Sketchbook. Fernando Rul came in and told us that he'd take his wife out to dinner at the West End. And he'd ordered a sukiyaki with some really spicy chutney and a cup of milky coffee and a scrummy chocky bitty. <laughs> the hoity toity flunky with the gravy on his dick, he brought them yucky tooty fruity and he didn't have a chili. <laughs> Ronnie Barker wasn't just a comedian, but a comic actor, a man of a thousand voices. By day a bank clerk, he honed his skills in part time rep with a different character every week. Radio followed in the 1950s, and then television, when he first teamed up with Ronnie Corbett. I look up to him because he is upper class, but I look down on him because he is lower class. Then came the two Ronnies. The programme ran for 17 years with audiences of up to 17 million. Oh. <laughs> Me, Hiawatha. Him, lower Wather. <laughs> Me and Mrs. Higginbottom love it when we get put on these orchestra jobs. My first husband used to play the organs. I've always quite liked twiddling. No. There were funny songs, cross-dressing, comic sketches, and all watched by whole families in the heyday of light entertainment. Not a very good win. Good evening. I am Russian. <laughs> Russian hit. The humour was gentle, the characters unthreatening and there was usually a twinkle in his eye. British hook. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Ronnie Barker himself <clears throat> believed porridge to be his best work. <laughs> Could you, Adam and Eve? Go to jail. <laughs> well, to the ones you can't spell, it won't make any difference, will it? After Porridge ended, he teamed up with David Jason to create another hit TV character, the stuttering shopkeeper Arkwright, in Open All Hours, which ran until the mid-1980s. And once they across that doorway, I'll have them. But in 1988, he retired. For the next decade, his appearances were limited to picking up various gongs, including a Lifetime Achievement Award from the BBC. I would like to be remembered as one of the funniest men that people have seen on television. Uh, he made us laugh. He did make us laugh. God bless him. In 2004, he was awarded a special BAFTA for services to comedy. And earlier this year, he reunited with Ronnie Corbett for the two Ronnie's sketchbook. Good evening. It's good to be back with you once again, isn't it, Ronnie? Indeed it is. A series collecting together the best clips from their long-running shows we have to treat the whole man. What about the hole in the man? <laughs> and bringing the comedy of the two Ronnies to a new generation. <laughs> Next week, we'll be talking to a mathematician from Addingham, a wrestler from Nottingham, and a plumber from Flushingham. <laughs> and doing our best to ignore a loudmouth from Effingham. <laughs> Until then, it's good night from me. And it's good night from him. Good night. Good night. Let's speak now on the phone to the writer and comedian Barry Cryer. Barry, good morning to you. Good morning. Oh, My so mobile's going. I'll, hold on, I'll switch it off. <laughs> OK, well, we'll bear with you as, as much as we can, but I was going to say, I'm a very sad line. day, obviously. Oh, you worked with him... five minutes. <laughs> OK, bye. I think we are losing. Hello. Hello. You hello, are... I'm here. Barry, hello, good morning. You are on the air live now. Now, you worked with Ronnie for, what, 40 years? Well, I knew him for, uh, yeah, about 45 years, yeah. Very sad news today. Your reaction? Pardon? Can you give us your reaction today? When did you first hear the well, news? It was, it was a shock. Maybe not a surprise. Don't misunderstand me, because I knew he wasn't, wasn't well. I was with Ronnie Corbett on Friday, and we were talking about our old friend, and uh, we knew things weren't good, but it still comes as an awful shock. Absolutely, and, and, and a great loss, of course, to, um, to us all, to, to the public and um, to the comic industry as a whole. He was a one-off. I seriously put him in the same league as Alec Guinness and Peter Sellers. If he'd gone into films, for instance, I think 
he, he would have been uh, enormous in films as well. What was it that made him stand out? Well, he was like a chameleon. I mean, you can't believe it's the same man if you watch Porridge and then you watch Open All Hours. You can't believe it's the same man. He was an amazing character comedian. And tell us a little bit about him as a person. He was a very private person, so very, we know... Very private, very quiet, loved his home and his family, and a very dry sense of humour, but he wasn't a sort of loud life and soul of the party at all. He was just quite quiet, but uh, very funny. And as well as working with him, you socialised with him? Oh, yes, yes, indeed. He was very good company. Oh, we, we all knew each other. There was a whole gang of us for all these years that uh, grew together. Give us some anecdotes, if you will, just to paint a picture of the man behind the, uh, the scenes. Oh, well, he, he had his alter ego, Gerald Wiley, the mysterious writer. He sent in sketches to the uh, two Ronnies under this assumed name so that they'd be judged properly and not just because he'd written them. And it was like an Agatha Christie thriller trying to work out who this man was. <laughs> and uh, he f finally we were all invited to a Chinese restaurant and uh, he stood up and said it was me to shouts of sit down we've all said that and he had to try and convince us that uh, Gerald Wiley was in fact him that was typical he loved playing that game what was your reaction then when he said that uh, I won't say I knew I had my suspicions but we were suspecting it was all sorts of people who were Gerald Wiley but then I thought yeah that that fits that's him that's his sense of humor it fooled us all uh, and Barry, I'm just looking here. Um, I, I want you to recall some jokes, if, if you can. I'm looking here. One of them, he said, we had hoped to be bringing you Arthur the Human Chameleon, but this afternoon he crawled across a tartan rug and died of ex exhaustion. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously, my delivery killed that completely, but he was a genius. <laughs> well, they got a laugh. <laughs> what, what, what are your memories of him? Well, as I said, he's a very quiet enormously professional and meticulous man every syllable had to be right and if you wrote for them you knew your stuff was going to be done so immaculately it was such a pleasure did, did you ever fall out did they ever fall out did you ever fall out i'm just wondering because no, he was no, i never fell out with him no no it's almost impossible to fall out with him if you if there was a, a discussion or a difference of opinion it was all sorted out so you know quietly and reasonably no he's a impossible man to fall out with i never achieved it <laughs> and, and barry if you can summarize them for us how will we remember ronnie barker a one-off you can't say somebody was a sort of ronnie barker there was only one barry cry thank you very much for joining us you're welcome it is a, a sad day, but I mean, you just read these jokes and, and the search for a man who terrorises nudist camps with a bacon slicer goes on. Inspector Lemuel Jones had a tip off this morning, but hopes to be back on duty tomorrow. I mean, everyone, aren't they? I mean, they, 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 he just wrote these jokes and delivered them in such a way you, you, you just laugh the whole time. Yes, I don't know how you got away with that one, but um, <laughs> we'll pass over that. So, but, so, you know, that's the glory. Is Simon, that, um, I think Simon's delivery is great. I, I'm not going to try anymore. <laughs> Um, yes, um, so it's, yes, a little bit of a cheeky innuendo, but, yeah, family humour, that's what it was all about. It was uh, the fact that, uh, you know, everyone, all these years later, can remember all of these moments. And, uh, you know, I defy anyone to, to go back over many people's careers and be able to remember sketches that appeared sort mm. of in the mid-1970s. There's them and there's, well, it's Eric and Ernie, isn't it? And there's almost, there's very little else that sort of stands out in your mind, but they, they've, they've stayed with us. And it's not just because they've been shown again in the last uh, few months, but, you know, four candles, or is it four candles? <laughs> you know, the man there standing at his uh, shop, shop yeah. door, um, the, uh, at the, at the uh, counter with all the uh, misunderstandings. You know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a one-off. Uh, you mentioned a little earlier he, it um, acted in two films as well. Remind us of the work that we're perhaps less familiar with. Well, he, of course, started off in Rep in Oxford. He was in then up, up to Manchester. It was Sir Peter Hall that uh, brought him to the West End, discovered him, considered him a great actor, and uh, also said that, uh, you know, he was destined for a, a good film career as well. It didn't truly happen. He had two films uh, in recent years, uh, The Gathering Storming, which he played uh, Churchill's butler. 
and uh, also My House in Umbria came straight after. And they suddenly said, what a great talent he is, what a great actor he is. And people almost forget all of this. Then, of course, there's the Frost Report. He was also in the radio series, the Navy Lark, series of roles there. So he's appeared again and again and again. And you remember Open All Hours and also uh, Porridge. It came from seven shows called Seven of One, in which Ronnie Barker played a different role in each of these. And then the public were involved in saying which ones should become series. Two of them became two of our best-loved sitcoms. Now sitcom writers are sitting around going, when are we going to get a hit? He had brought up a couple in a couple of years. It was absolutely extraordinary. You, you mentioned the background in rep, and was that perhaps the secret with so many of these older comedians, that they, they were grounded in humour and dealing with an, a live audience? They'd learned how to act. Mm. They'd learned how to play different roles. An awful lot of actors these days are taken on to be themselves. A lot of soap acting is about discovering the person within and acting that person out. Whereas he came from a position whereby you had to be completely different mm. every week and you had to bash it out and you had to work really hard and you learnt what got a laugh, what didn't get a laugh because you were mm. there in front of a live audience week after week after week. And it is the thing about comedians. The more they've actually worked with live audiences, the more they've actually heard who laughs at what, how they laugh, and how to time a joke, then they realize that's how it's done. And it was quite a few years. I mean, by, it was 1971 before the, the two Ronnies happened, and they were, they were two middle-aged men, and it went on for 17 years. But it was a sign that they knew what was going on, and they knew what worked, because there were an army of writers behind them. It wasn't just Ronnie Parker. There were so many others. Barry Cryer, of course, was one of the big writers there. But they were the people who knew what worked, what didn't work, and they could say, I'm not saying that. I can say it that way, just as Barry Cryer said. Mm. And obviously, a lot of today's talent can learn a lot from him, even um, now. Absolutely. Talking about Peter Kay, um, there's a figure, wrote to him, eulogised over him, thought he was thought he was marvellous, and you just got to look and see how many DVDs Peter Kay is selling, and you realise it's the same form of quite gentle humour, observational, bit silly, but essentially something that a whole family could actually laugh at. And for many people, they felt that's an era that's passed. What we need now is something that's aimed at very small age groups, and they're all got different senses of humour. If something's funny, everyone will laugh. David, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Well, we'll have a lot more reaction, of course, to that news that we brought you in the last hour, the death of the comedian Ronnie Barkey. He died peacefully at home yesterday at the age of 76. <music> comedian and entertainer Ronnie Barker has died. He was 76. Tributes have been pouring into the star best known for Porridge and the Two Ronnies. The comic actor and comedian Ronnie Barker has died. He was 76. Best known as one half of the comedy duo The Two Ronnies, he also had huge success with Porridge and Open All Hours. In 2004, he was honoured by BAFTA with a special tribute award and returned to our screens earlier this year to present The Two Ronnies sketchbook. Well, our arts correspondent David Silito is with us. David, just to sum up, we've been having so much reaction, so many tributes um, this morning. How will we remember Ronnie Barker? Well, he was a man who was with the two Ronnies, who was a, an early evening stalwart of Saturday evenings for 17 years. He was also the star of two of the most popular sitcoms in BBC history of Open All Hours and, of course, Porridge. And uh, add all that together, the Frost Report, the Navy Lark, and all the other series that he was a part of, he must be one of the greatest comedy performers Britain has produced. Human chameleon, I think Barry Cryer described him, and uh, that's, that's absolutely right, because he was able to change characters so, so brilliantly. The uh, bumptious civil servant, the uh, character at the uh, dinner party, the tramp at the end of the uh, allotment, uh, Fletch in Porridge, and Arkwright in Open All Hours completely different, every one of them, you'd hardly realise it was Ronnie Barker. We don't really know Ronnie Barker at all. He didn't talk very much about himself, a very private man, but the characters loved, completely different, a brilliant actor, and of course a man who wrote much of the material for the two Ronnies, as Gerald Wiley, um, so also a brilliant comic writer. And a gentle 
comic as well. It was always very gentle, the comedy, wasn't it? No uneasy laughs. Um, a few innuendos, a mm -hmm. bit of rudery every now and again, mm -hmm. um, but it was something that you were quite happy, the kids to be watching, the grandparents to be watching everyone together. And it was proved in earlier this year when the two Ronnies sketchbook came up back onto our screens. There they were in their 70s, showing us old sketches, some of them 20 years old, and there was still a big audience for it. It proved something. It wasn't just nostalgia. It proved they were still funny. Well, David Fennell, thank you very much. Well, let's uh, take a look back now at Ronnie Barker's career. Benando reports. The other day, a man came in and told us that he'd taken his wife out to dinner at the West End, and he'd ordered a sukiyaki with some really spicy chutney and a cup of milky coffee and a scrummy chucky bicky. <laughs> Hoity-toity flunky with a gravy on his dick, he brought them yucky tooty fruity and he didn't have a cherry. <laughs> Ronnie Barker wasn't just a comedian, but a comic actor, a man of a thousand voices. By day a bank clerk, he honed his skills in part-time rep, with a different character every week. Radio followed in the 1950s, and then television, when he first teamed up with Ronnie Corbett. I look up to him because he is upper class, but I look down on him because he is lower class. <laughs> Then came the two Ronnies. The programme ran for 17 years with audiences of up to 17 million. Oh! <laughs> Me, Hiawatha. Him, Loawatha. <laughs> Me and Mrs. Higginbottom love it when we get put on these orchestra jobs. My first husband used to play the organ, so I've always quite liked twiddling. No. <laughs> there were funny songs, cross-dressing, comic sketches and all watched by whole families in the heyday of light entertainment. Not a very good win. Good evening. I am Russian. <laughs> Russian head. The humour was gentle, the characters unthreatening, and there was usually a twinkle in his eye. British hook. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Ronnie Barker himself believed <coughs> porridge to be his best work. <laughs> Good you, Adam and Evie. Go to jail. <laughs> well, to the ones who can't spell it, it won't make any difference, will it? After porridge ended, he teamed up with David Jason to create another hit TV character, the stuttering shopkeeper Arkwright, in Open All Hours, which ran until the mid-1980s. <laughs> and once they across that doorway, I'll have them. <laughs> But in 1988, he retired. For the next decade, his appearances were limited to picking up various gongs, including a Lifetime Achievement Award from the BBC. I would like to be remembered as one of the funniest men that people have seen on television. Uh, he made us laugh. He did make us laugh. God bless him. In 2004, he was awarded a special BAFTA for services to comedy. And earlier this year, he reunited with Ronnie Corbett for the two Ronnie's sketchbook. Good evening. It's good to be back with you once again, isn't it, Ronnie? Indeed it is. A series collecting together the best clips from their long-running shows. We have to treat the whole man. What about the hole in the man? <laughs> and bringing the comedy of the two Ronnie's to a new generation. <laughs> Next week, we'll be talking to a mathematician from Addingham, a wrestler from Nottingham, and a plumber from Flushingham. <laughs> and doing our best to ignore a loudmouth from Effingham. <laughs> Until then, it's good night from me. And it's good night from him. Good night. <laughs> Ronnie Barker there, he passed away yesterday. Of course, Ronnie Barker considered the sitcom Porridge among his best work. And I'm pleased to say we're joined now by Sam Kelly, who played Bunny Warren, a fellow inmate at Slade Prison. Good morning to you. Good morning. When did you first hear that um, he'd passed away? About ten minutes ago. Oh, really? Listening to, uh, listening to the radio. And uh, it's, it's, str it's a strange morning because I'm sitting here laughing at those clips and feeling very sad at the same time, you know? Yes, what is your, give us a sense of your reaction then. What, what did you feel when you first heard? Uh, it, it's, it's too early. We needed another ten years of Ronnie. He deserved another ten years at least. It's too early for him to die. It's a great shame. Great shame. A great I'd, like to, I'd like to have seen him perhaps do uh, another compilation series or some new sketches or something, you know. Do you think he would have done, though? We were speaking a little earlier, you know, he retired, of course, in 1986, saying that actually he didn't have much more in the way of material that he wanted to give, perhaps. Yes, you're probably right. He probably wouldn't. He was a wonderful writer, of course, as we heard about the, the, wonderful, the famous Gerald Wiley 
He used to he used to send the sketches in written by himself and throw them out because he said they were no good. <laughs> Extraordinary. And uh, maybe he'd have he'd have written something, or maybe he'd just have carried on disappearing from having left the business. You know. Now, you worked with him, of course, in Porridge. I'm yes. looking at the date for that, 1973, which seems quite unbelievable. Um, what, what were those days like? Those days were fantastic, particularly for me and my, and my ilk. I just finished a lot of work in the theatre. I was new to television, really. And to work with Ronnie, he was such an amazingly generous performer. He knew that he was uh, the star of the show. He, there were wonderful scripts. He had no need to be selfish or jealous of anybody else, and he was a marvellously generous actor. He was an actor, like we all were. And uh, he, he gave us lots of chances to get our own laughs, as well as the ones he got for himself. He was, as uh, I heard Nicholas Parsons a few minutes ago on the radio saying, he was something of a genius, and he, he, he was, it's true. Interesting that you say that, that he was able to be so generous with um, other actors. That would suggest that perhaps he was secure in his own talent. Absolutely. He knew exactly how good he was. He knew that he was the funniest man around. He was very secure with Norman Stanley Fletcher, and they wouldn't be with such scripts. <laughs> and uh, he was, uh, as a result of that, able to be very generous with the rest of us. Now, he made us all laugh, of course, still makes us laugh when we're looking back at um, his pictures and, and, and skits there. Did he make you laugh? Oh, yes, he did, and still does when I see those clips. And I hope there's a, I hope there's a, a generation of kids now who will... Uh, see the stuff he, he did in the past and, and laugh as well. Um, we laughed in rehearsals all the time. Uh, there are still clips, still little scenes from Porridge, and I know, I can see them now, and I know the odd line that Ronnie put in himself. Maybe even on the night he might have done a little line uh, which wasn't in the script, and I can recognise them. They still make me roar. <laughs> did you know at the time that what you had was uh, so special? Uh, yes, I think we did. Uh, I, as I say, I was very green, so perhaps I wasn't too aware of it, but it didn't take me long to realise how well it was going in the studio. And I, I know that, uh, that the highest viewing figures one week, I can't remember what, I think it may have gone out on a Sunday for a while, the highest viewing figures we got were 22 million, which when you look in today's context is extraordinary. It is indeed. And, and Sam, before we let you go, if you could just give us one sentence perhaps, how will we remember, how should we remember Ronnie Barker? I think he said it himself just now. Uh, he, um, We'll remember him as somebody who made us all laugh and make us feel better about ourselves. Sam Kelly, thank you very much for joining us. Nice to talk to you. Thank you. Pleasure. Well, a lot of emails from you already uh, about this. Uh, he was a proper comedian, no filth, no swearing, just good fun and good acting for all the family. That's from Emin Croydon. I can't think of any other TV performer who has given so much pleasure to so many people for so long. On behalf of the nation, Thank you, Ronnie. That's from Phil Broughton in Stamford. And finally, Madeline has uh, emailed from the Isle of Wight. Thanks for the four candles, Ronnie. Huge, huge loss to the entertainment world. Remarkably unique talent. A gaping hole has emerged in the industry today, and no one will be able to fill it. Mm -hmm. uh, your tributes to Ronnie Barker, bbc.co.uk forward slash have your say. We'll be reading more of those a little later. Well, earlier I spoke to Michael Parkinson, who described to me Barker's legacy. One of our greatest, very greatest comedy actors, that's what he was. I mean, he wasn't a comedian, not by instinct at all. He was a, uh, an actor with a fastidious, a writer's ear for, for a good script as well. I mean, he was a writer. He was proud of his writing ability. He wrote very well indeed. And, uh, and if you look at his career, what's interesting about it was he didn't do too much bad work, actually. You know, there's been a very sort of seamless uh, series of, of very, very good parts uh, through, through the years. And, and, of course, with the two Ronnies, he, one of the great uh, television partnerships. Was he a shy man? Very shy. A shy man uneasy with, with, with the fame that, 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 that came with the job. Uh, a, a man who liked to observe in the show. He reminded me very much of Alec Guinness in that sense. He was a, that kind of shadowy kind of figure who circled around. You never were quite aware of him in the social occasion. He, he didn't like them. But my word, when he stood centre stage, you better watch him. I mean, he had that quality that you had to watch him. A wonderful performer. We're just looking at pictures of him with David Jason. He, he did 
form wonderful relationships with, with whoever he was working with. Well, I think the people I actually worked with him were, were regarded themselves as being fortunate to work with him. Uh, I mean, he, he, was, he didn't, as I said, have too many flops in his life. <laughs> he did choose well, and, and he was a wonderful actor to work with. I mean, you see the work he did with, with Ronnie Corbett. I mean, the two of them, it's a wonderful combination. He, he was a generous performer, too, of course. That's the other thing. You know, he, he didn't try to be a star. He was a star, but didn't try to be one. He didn't kind of, you know, step center stage and say, no, I demand you look at me. You looked at him because he was very good at what he did. What was he like to interview? It was impossible. He wasn't. He didn't like it. I mean, I, I tried twice, and I we were friends. <laughs> I had a hard time, but, but because not because he was being he was being indifferent, but, but because he genuinely did not like talking about himself. He couldn't think why there was all that fuss. He just couldn't understand that he was doing a job. And his job he did to the best of his ability, and he, he couldn't understand why people sort of made a fuss of him. I mean, he, he, of course, I mean, he, he, he loved going back to, to BAFTA and getting that, that big BAFTA award. Of course he did, because that was, that was due recognition of, of, of his talent and the years he put in the business. But generally speaking, he was an object lesson to, to a lot of people who actually seek the limelight with, with half his talent. He stood the test of time, didn't he? Was that because he, he represented perhaps a gentler age? No, I think because he was hugely talented, and, and I think because he had a regard for the word, for the written word, and, and as I said, he had a good judgment about it, a writer's judgment he had about, about what worked and what didn't work. And, uh, and of course, too, I mean, years and years of experience came to bear. I mean, it wasn't just in... He wasn't just invented by television. I mean, what you saw on television was the result of lots and lots of hard work in writing comedy, performing comedy. He was a finished article when he appeared on television. Now, we were earlier this year shown glimpses of, of the old two Ronnies when, when he and Ronnie Corbett, Corbett were reunited, mm. and people watched it in droves. They still had it, didn't they? Yes, I mean, there's a, there's a lesson there maybe for, for programme makers. You know, they've, they've gone very far down the road of looking for this sort of 16 to 34 audience while missing out on a larger audience, which includes myself, who would sit there and, and relish the, the thought of two people as talented as those two coming back and doing another kind of series. They'd have to be very, very good at their jobs to, to equal or, or, or surpass what the two Ronnies did. What was your favourite Ronnie Barker character? I love him in Porridge. I just thought it was a magnificent, rounded performance. I mean, what you had there was a wonderful comic creation, and yet a fully fleshed-out character. So you laughed at him, but there's also something about him as well that was much deeper, much more profound. And that was Ronnie's talent. That was his, 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 his genius, if you like. Well, that was Michael Parkinson talking to me a little earlier. And David, just um, we'll finish with you, I think, because just listening to Sam Kelly and indeed Michael Parkinson there, of course, those viewers, 22 million, but not just popular with the public. He was hugely popular with everyone that he worked with. Everyone says he's meticulous, that he uh, worked very hard. He would have rehearsed and rehearsed until he got it right. Entertainers, the popular entertainers, were very powerful in those days and they called the shots. But the thing was... He wasn't interested in how much time he appeared on screen or what his profile was. It all seemed to be, from everyone who's been speaking this morning, whether or not it was funny. Mm. And because it was funny, everyone else who appeared on screen with him benefited from that. They all understood that there was an end product there, that he was working hard. And I think he enjoyed the process. I think he enjoyed the process of working it through and of making it as good as possible. And I think towards the end of the career, just before he retired, he maybe realised that maybe there wasn't quite so much material there in future and he didn't want to be producing anything of lower quality um, and um, I think that is what gets a lot of people's admiration especially other comedians and other actors that it is professionalism and I think there's another thing here it's also nostalgia for a certain time in TV history when there were audiences of 22 million when you went back to school the next day or back to work and everyone had seen the same joke and you could say did you see that on television and I think he's one of those few performers and I don't think it'll happen again where, yes, everyone did see it last night. They all laughed and they all laughed together. Yeah. David Silito, thank you very much. Speaking about Ronnie Barker, of course, who's died at the age of 76. And digital viewers can see more on the life of Ronnie Barker by pressing the red button and selecting news multi-screen. Well, we've uh, been reporting, of course, the reaction to the death of uh, Ronald Barker. Ronnie Barker, and uh, we've just had this from Michael Palin, who says Ronnie was a straightforward, down-to-earth man who had this extraordinary ability to make the nation laugh, probably more often than anyone else 
I know, that tribute came in the last few minutes. And uh, we've had 1,500 emails from you in the past hour. Thank you very much for those. I'm just picking a few here. Joe from Hereford says, one of the funniest men ever. Witty, clever, but never nasty humour. Um, he will be sadly missed. And Dave Bourne in Brighton says, God bless you, Ronnie. Only last night you had me laughing again watching you on Going Straight. And uh, from Bumble in Dartford in Kent, from the Navy Lark to open all hours, this man was a jewel in the comedy crown. And... Michael in London, a genuine loss for the old set of great British comedians. And it's good night from him, he writes at the end. Uh, thank you very much for all the emails. We'll be bringing more on those at www.bbc.co.uk forward slash have your say. And we'll be bringing you more on that. And uh, if you want to see a look back at Ronnie Barker's life, that's the place. For at BBC, I just press red on your digital remote. And for digital satellite viewers, there it is, top right of the six available screens. The comedian Ronnie Barker has died at the age of 76, best known as one half of the comedy duo The Two Ronnies. He also had huge success with Porridge and Open All Hours. In 2004, he was honoured with a BAFTA Special Tribute Award and returned to television earlier this year to present The Two Ronnies Sketchbook. He died at his home yesterday after a long illness. Well, the broadcaster Michael Parkinson described him as a wonderful performer whose down-to-earth nature made him a pleasure to work with. And the people like you worked with him regarded themselves as being fortunate to work with him. Uh, I mean, he, he, was, he didn't, as I said, have too many flops in his life. <laughs> he did choose well, and, and he was a wonderful actor to work with. I mean, you see the work he did with, with Ronnie Corbett. I mean, the two of them, it's a wonderful combination. He, he was a generous performer, too, of course. That's the other thing. You know, he, he didn't try to be a star. He was a star, but didn't try to be one. He didn't kind of, you know, step center stage and say, no, I demand you look at me. You looked at him because he was very good at what he did. Well, the tributes have been pouring in, of course, regarding the death of Ronnie Barker at the age of 76. The BBC's head of comedy, John Plowman, said his talent was unique. He wasn't just a comedian, but a comic actor, a man of a thousand voices. He learnt his skills... And kind of an encourager of young talent, as well as, uh, uh, as, well as a keen uh, um, exponent of his own. Um, somebody was telling me a story only yesterday about uh, Peter Kay, who was a huge fan of Ronnie's and, and nervous of writing to him, and uh, uh, finally packed up the courage and wrote a, wrote a you know, eulogizing letter to him. And um, Barker sent him a letter back uh, on uh, HM Prison Slade uh, note paper that he'd had specially. Uh, especially done, uh, and, and he wrote it in the character of Fletch, which was, uh, you know, just a, just a wonderful thing for him to do to a younger to a younger comedian. Uh, and and Peter, I know, took took the compliment well, and and indeed went out and got some paper printed in the uh, Phoenix Knights Club uh, name and uh, and wrote back in his own character. Just uh, no, an extraordinary guy, and and as I say, an encourager as well as a as well as a brilliant performer and writer. But what was it about him that made him so special then? I think he had an everyman quality, uh, but I think he, as Michael was saying, he kind of loved words. Um, you know, the story is, is famous of, of the fact that he wrote some of the two Ronnies under a pseudonym of Gerald Wiley uh, in order to see whether what he wrote would get through, as it were. You know, he didn't want to be treated specially uh, with it. Uh, and I think uh, there was a there was then a meeting at which all the writers were gathered, and Gerald Wiley didn't appear, and and Barker finally owned up, um, which was kind of a mark of the man. You know, he wanted to check that uh, anything he did was was of the highest quality. As we've been hearing from David Sidato here, hugely meticulous. Um, he said his favourite character was um, was Fletch in Porridge. What well, do you think you'd uh, have to go the? A long way or... to that, wouldn't you? Sorry. I think I'd join him on that. I think I'd join him on that. I mean, you know, uh, it, it, you say the two words, Ronnie and Barker, and you kind of go, well, that's Fletch. But it's also all those wonderful sketches, I suppose, Four Candles is, is the one I remember just because it's just an extraordinary piece of writing. And also the, 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 the marvellous kind of piece of camera, the, the sort of appeals he did, the... Uh, uh, you know, appeals on behalf of obscure uh, apparent charities and things where uh, 
he would answer the question before the question had been answered. Um, there's an extraordinary number of sketches he does that in. Just, just a genius. And the timing of this, of course, we were just saying that you know, his, his comedy has stood the test of time. Indeed, he just launched a retrospective, a look back at his career. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, uh, I think it, what was interesting about the, the reuniting earlier this year was it got a young audience as well as it got an old audience. You know, he, he, he could just do it. And it wasn't so we were just saying he, it was the acting, it was the writing that he was so yeah. um, so good at. What was he like um, to, to work with? We you know what were the reports that people said well, he was I like to say, work I with? Mean, I, I didn't work with him very much. I was lucky enough to work with him a couple of times, but but only on very small things. He was he was a professionalist. I mean, he, you know, he was a man who wanted to make sure everything worked before he did it. Pull, pull the cord, mm -hmm. open up the main chute. That didn't open. You've been told that you then pulled the best remembered Ronnie Barker. So much of the comedy we have nowadays is after the watershed. Yeah, but... so. You're obviously, uh, you're hearing Ronnie Barker, I think uh, you're probably watching this very program. And uh, when you look at pictures of Ronnie Barker, what goes through your mind? What goes through my mind is the way that he passed on his fountain of knowledge on comedy. He used to sit with those of us who produced his shows and say, that's a good joke, but I tell you what, if we just change that word, put that word there, put this here, and it was a bit like learning Latin verse. You know, there was a rhythm to a joke, and he was able to show us how that worked, and it worked every time in the news desk sequence. What was your favourite Ronnie Barker line? Oh, it'll be a slightly rude one. I, I think we can forgive that, given that we're looking back at a wonderful career. I, I think uh, the one where he said that a Billy Smart elephant did a ton on the M1 and motors, motorists uh, have to treat it as a roundabout. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, there was the other one. The toilets at a local police station have been stolen. Oh, yeah. Police say they've got nothing to go nothing on. Nothing to go on. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it was good, honest, you know, comedy in the old musical tradition. And... What about when he worked with Ronnie Corbett? He, he was able to change gear, wasn't he, every time? Yes, he was. Um, I mean, that was an absolutely marvellous partnership, which, will, like Morgan and Wise, I don't think we'll see the like of again. Because it really... You felt... I know with Ronnie Barker, you felt safe with him. You, you knew the whole family could watch, Granny and the kids and that, and you felt safe. You didn't have to worry whether anything crude or rude would be said he, you, he was a great and you knew you knew you were going to laugh mm. with Ronnie Barker immediately he came on the screen you knew it was going to amuse you it, it looked so effortless which probably mm -hmm. means it really wasn't believe me it didn't I mean great thing about Ronnie Barker he was very demanding uh, he was very precise in what he wanted he was always right always right and uh, you know, they, it proves that you can't just go on and tell jokes. You have to work out the construction. Do you have a particular memory of him? Do I have a memory of him? Again, it, like, he always had trouble keeping his weight down. We were in Australia and he said to me one evening, he said, Michael, I'm really doing well. He said, I've had a leaf of lettuce today, a piece of ham with the, the fat cut off, I've, I've had a tomato and uh, I've had an apple. And I said, that's wonderful, Ronnie. And that's all you've had? He said, yes. He said, now let's open another bottle of red wine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Michael, uh, I, I'm sure many, many tributes will be paid throughout the day. You, you work particularly closely with him. A, f a final word from you about what Ronnie Barker meant to comedy in this country. Ronnie, Co Ronnie Barker is meant to comedy in this country, laughs, big laughs, and laughs that you will always remember. That was Michael Hill talking to me a little earlier. And laughs that you are certainly remembering, judging by the emails that are coming in. Um, we'll just read a few of them now. Uh, Porridge and open all hours are my childhood classics. I would like to say a fond farewell to the gentlemen of comedy. All the best, Fletcher. That's from Ryan Slater in Stoke-on-Trent. Ian in Glasgow says the two Ronnies were without doubt the best comedy double act of all time. 
Ronnie Barker is a major part of television history in this country and the, in the era of Here Today, Gone Tomorrow TV stars, let's hope Ronnie Barker receives the tributes he so richly deserves. And uh, Simon Abbott in London, Ronnie Barker epitomised the comic backbone of our nation, light-hearted, irreverent and often silly humour that was truly wonderful and which has stood the test of time. Thank you, Ronnie Barker, for bringing laughter to so many for so long. That's Simon Abbott in London. More of your emails later, looking back at the life of Ronnie Barker, who's died at the age of 76. I don't want to follow someone else's footsteps. He has that confidence to know that what he did, he could do. And it is a great gift. And, uh, but it just shows that he could have done anything. And he did do an amazing amount. And he's got a huge legacy, which will be played endlessly. I heard someone say earlier on in the, the, the news there that just something in the, the heyday of uh, situation comedy. And it, 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 we could still produce as many good situation comedies in the past, but I think it comes down to cost now. And they find also that these reality shows also get the audience, so they don't make them. But um, the era of Ronnie Barker and all the other great comedy artists around that time will be remembered, and they'll continue to be played. I mean, all David Jason stuff is being replayed, and all the other great comedy situation comedies of the past coming back. Ronnie's there. He'll live with us forever. And it, that's a wonderful legacy for his family, wonderful legacy for the comedy of this country, because Ronnie Barker was a true icon of situation comedy and character comedy, and there was nobody, to my mind, to touch him. Nicholas Parsons, thank you very much. Well, uh, Ronnie Barker considered the sitcom Porridge among his best work. Sam Kelly, who played the role of the fellow convict Bunny Warren, said the com comedian's death was untimely. He deserved another ten years at least. It's too early for him to die. It's a great shame. Great shame. A great I'd, like to, I'd like to have seen him perhaps do uh, another compilation series or some new sketches or something, you know. Do you think he would have done, though? We were speaking a little earlier, you know, he retired, of course, in 1986, saying that actually he didn't have much more in the way of material that he wanted to give, perhaps. Yes, you're probably right. He probably wouldn't. He was a wonderful writer, of course, as we heard about the, the, wonderful, the famous Gerald Wiley. He used, to, he used to send sketches in written by himself and throw them out because he said they were no good. <laughs> Extraordinary. And uh, maybe he'd have, he'd have written something, or maybe he'd just have carried on disappearing from having left the business, you know. Now, you worked with him, of course, in Porridge. I'm yes. looking at the date for that, 1973, which seems quite unbelievable. Um, what, what were those days like? Those days were fantastic, particularly for me and my, and my ilk. I just finished a lot of work in the theatre. I was new to television, really. And to work with Ronnie, he was such an amazingly generous performer. He knew that he was uh, the star of the show. He, they were wonderful scripts. He had no need to be selfish or jealous of anybody else, and he was a marvellously generous actor. He was an actor, like we all were. And uh, he, he gave us lots of chances to get our own laughs, as well as the ones he got for himself. He was, as uh, I heard Nicholas Parsons a few minutes ago on the radio, saying he was something of a genius, and he, he, he was, it's true. Interesting that you say that, that he was able to be so generous with um, other actors. That would suggest that perhaps he was secure in his own talent. Absolutely. He knew exactly how good he was. He knew that he was the funniest man around. He was very secure with Norman Stanley Fletcher, and who wouldn't be with such scripts. <laughs> and uh, he was, uh, as a result of that, able to be very generous with the rest of us. Now, he made us all laugh, of course, still makes us laugh when we're looking back at um, his pictures and, and, and skits there. Did he make you laugh? Oh, yes, he did, and still does when I see those clips. And I hope there's a, I hope there's a, a generation of kids now who will... Uh, see the stuff he, he did in the past and, and laugh as well. Um, we laughed in rehearsals all the time. Uh, there are still clips, still little scenes from Porridge, and I know, I can see them now, and I know the odd line that Ronnie put in himself. Maybe even on the night he might have done a little line uh, which wasn't in the script, and I can recognise them. They still make me roar. <laughs> did you know at the time that what you had was uh, so special? Uh, yes, I think we did. Uh, I, as I say, I was very green so perhaps I wasn't too aware of it, but it didn't take me long to realise how well it was going in the studio. And I, I know that, uh, that the highest viewing figures, one week, I can't remember what, I think he may have gone out on a Sunday for a while, the highest viewing figures we got were 22 million, which when you look in today's context is extraordinary. It is indeed. And, and Sam, before we let you go, if you could just give us one sentence, perhaps, how will we remember, how should we remember Ronnie Barker? I think he said it himself just now. Uh, he, um, We'll remember him 
as somebody who made us all laugh and make us feel better about ourselves. He did indeed. Sam Kelly, who of course worked with Ronnie Barker on Porridge. Well, uh, for those of you who are digital viewers, you can see more on the life of Ronnie Barker by pressing the red button on your handsets and just selecting News Multi-Screen.